Hello everybody, it's me, Swifty. I am here today. I am going to be doing a book review of How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, what the new science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. Um, I guess I just want to start off with my initial thoughts of the book. Um, it was probably the most inspiring book I've ever read simply because it seems like there's such a good opportunity here with psychedelics to make a huge impact in the world, not just for people with mental health issues, but for practically every single person living in this world. Um, I'm not going to touch too much on why I think that right now, but yeah, so it was a really good introduction to learning about the history of scientific research of psychedelics and uh, his journeys through them. He took three different types, tells us about that, and then it talks about the neuroscience of it, kind of what it does to your brain, and then it finishes off with something called the trip treatment, which really touches on the scientific studies of these different psychedelic medicines. Um, the reason I say it's a medicine and not a drug is because the word psychedelic means mind manifesting, and it is more of a medicine because when taken in the right environment with a good set and setting, which means being in a very safe place, either in nature, in a room, uh, well decorated, and with people you trust, or if you trust yourself enough, it is possible to just do it by yourself, although not recommended. So yeah, I think it's a medicine because of the long lasting effects that it has shown to have rather than the medicines that some people take every day and really don't see any effects at all. So that's what I think is really cool about it. Um, and it's also, it's, it's a teacher because it breaks down your thoughts into the simplest way so you can really just see it from a form of no judgment. And what I mean by this is that it temporarily dissolves your ego, which um, means that all of the things that you judge certain things in the world or judge yourself is usually because your ego is telling you to think a certain way about things rather than being open-minded and realizing that your thoughts about it are probably not too important compared to the overall view of things. So yeah, that's just a basic um, thought of that. And that's kind of the introduction of this video. The next thing I wanna start doing is just going through the book um, and some really important and thought provoking um, quotes from it. So yeah. All right, so I got my notes right here from the book and I'm just gonna be going through some of the most important things or some of the coolest things that I read about. Um, I'm gonna start off with that um, the basic, uh, psychedelic experience, um, quoted from this book says that it gives you the feeling of co-creatureliness with all things alive, and that should enter our consciousness more fully and counterbalance the materialistic and nonsensical technological developments and able to Return us, um, in order to enable us to return to the roses, to the flowers, to nature, where we belong. Uh, I like this quote because, um, it's, I would say, common knowledge that we are going way too far with technology. Not to discredit that technology is a great 
use for lots of things, but we're looking too far in some ways um, for types of medicines and certain types of things when the answer has somewhat been there for a while, but we're just trying to get too technical with it. So that's one. Um, one thing I thought was really interesting that uh, Stan Islav Grof, which was one of the early doctors, I believe in the 1960s or 70s, he predicted that psychedelics would be for psychiatry, what the microscope is for biology, or the telescope is for astronomy. That's because these tools make it possible to study important processes that under normal circumstances are not available for direct observation. So that would be tying into the fact that psychedelics go into a part of your conscious slash brain that are not accessible without either being a long-term meditator or uh, using psychedelic medicines. So I think that's cool and it seems like a very bold statement so it's pretty interesting. The next thing I want to touch on is that someone quoted that they believe that or they dilated on the idea of psilocybin being a chemical messenger sent from Earth um, because it does grow from cow shit or it grows in certain areas of the world. I'm not exactly sure to be specific on that, but it says a chemical messenger sent from Earth and how we had been elected by virtue of the gift of consciousness and language to hear it and call, to hear its call and act before it's too late. I think that really ties um, into right now because we're getting into a point where it's going to be too late if we don't act. And the fact that maybe something could help us switch our mindsets of what really needs to be done is pretty interesting. So the next thing I want to touch on is Back in 1970, psychedelics were outlawed and listed as a Schedule One substance, uh, which means that there's no medicinal benefits, which doesn't even make sense because at the time there was so many studies being done um, on these medicines and shown to the government that it was clear that the main use of them was for medicine. And the reason, one of the reasons that it got outlawed is because there was um, a few people that were becoming very nonchalant about giving it out to the public and telling everybody that they need to do it and stuff like that. And that ended up causing a massive breakdown in people's projects and um, ultimately shutting down every center that was studying it in the US, which really sucked for our society. Um, one thing that was really, really interesting, uh, there was a Harvard student that was tracked down, um, that was part of one of the Harvard psilocybin projects or studies, I believe, and he was tracked down and he agreed to, uh, agreed to talking to this person if his name wasn't used and he was asked if he learned anything or how his experience was, and he, quote, said, Yes, sir, I did, and it was the most educational experience I've ever had at Harvard. So if, I think if that doesn't make you uh, question a little bit of something about it or spark your eyebrows up a little bit, whatever, I guess. Um, someone, Timothy Leary, who was a part of the social uh, kind of breakdown of it that caused the outlaw of it, quoted that LSD is more frightening than the bomb and that the kids who take LSD aren't going to fight in your wars and that they're not going to join your corporations. You could say that's total bullshit, but in the mid-1960s, 
after uh, these studies were begun, um, tens of thousands of American children did drop out and young men were refusing to go to Vietnam. So maybe there's a direct connection to that. Maybe there isn't, but another interesting fact or a quote from the book. Um, one thing that these medicines do or that it kind of helps you have a broader perspective of maybe some of the problems that you're having. Someone quoted during their trip, it's good to say, what are you doing in my mind? What do you have to teach me? So if you look at, um, for example, I know it's not this simple, but if you look at like maybe someone with depression and if they looked at their depression or certain parts of it as why is it there and what does it have to teach you? It could potentially teach you about some of the destructive behaviors or patterns that you have begun or that you have become stuck into. So that's a little interesting. And um, the important thing about it with the dissolution of ego, uh, Sigmund Freud, who was pretty credited in psychology, uh, he said, there is nothing of which we are more certain than the feeling of ourself, our own ego. So if there's something that can temporarily dissolve this, uh, that would seem beneficial. And the next thing I want to jump into is the part of the book called The Trip Treatment, where they um, there's a section on people that are dying, that are going to die. There's a section that people with depression, and then there's a section, excuse me, on people with addiction. So dying, depression, and addiction. Tom Incel. He was the ex-head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Qu quoted, I believe this was in 2015 or 2016, that mental health treatment in this country is so broken. When the head of the Men National Institute of Mental Health is saying that, is saying that, um, that should raise concern in some of these medicines that we're giving to people or just some of the ways that we're treating people. I just think that shows something. Um, the next thing that I want to touch on is that someone quoted after having one of these experiences, uh, his name was Patrick, and he was dying of cancer. He said, everyone deserved to have this experience. If everyone did, no one could ever do harm to another again. Wars would be impossible to wage. So I, I think that just touches on the part of the very peaceful product of it that it brings to people. And this is from the, the dying section. But he claimed that he, he said, I took a tour of my lungs. I went into my lungs and saw two spots, and they were no big deal. I was being told without words not to worry about the cancer. It's minor in the scheme of things, simply an imperfection of your humanity, and that the more important matter, the real work to be done is before you. Again, love. So I just think that's absolutely crazy and seems unreal that someone dying of cancer could... Uh, end up viewing their cancer as not that big of a deal somehow and to break it down for themselves so they don't have to constantly be thinking um, about how it's going to kill them. And the most interesting thing from Patrick that was said two months later after his experience on psilocybin was that he claimed he was the hap he feels the happiest in his life and that he is the luckiest man on earth. So that's crazy that someone dying of cancer would say that. 
And the next thing I want to touch on is the addiction part. Um, they gave mushrooms to people with uh, people that were lifetime smokers. And as one lifetime smoker put it, smoking became irrelevant, so I stopped. And that's just kind of interesting because it shows that some of these people, even though they know that these substances are killing them, they still can't stop. And then it seems as if this might flip the switch or something like that. And they did a study, a very small uh, study of 15 volunteers who were trying to quit. And after one dose of psilocybin, six months later, 80% were abstinent. And one year later, 67% still were not smoking. Pretty cool. And the last, the last one is about the depression. And there was one woman who I'm assuming had been on antidepressants for quite a long time, claimed that she was depression free for the first time since 1991. And she quoted, it was like a holiday away from the prison of my brain. I felt free, carefree, and re-energized. So that was everything as far as the notes that I took on this book. And I just think that some of these things literally don't even seem like they could be possible. Like how could you get someone with cancer to stop fearing that they're going to die and stuff like that. So I just think it's a really provoking, really good provoking group of studies that potentially shows that these medicines should be used a lot more frequently in people with mental health problems. So how I want to finish out this video is hopefully you guys got a lot of good information um, or at least enjoyed the information that you're hearing from these findings and just from the book in general. But um, I truly believe in the near future, hopefully, hopefully as soon as possible, these psychedelic medicines will be being used worldwide to help people that aren't receiving the treatment that they need and even to help people that think that they have normal lives or think that they're okay but um, these things can show you things that you either ignore or just completely forgot about and help you potentially with some past trauma or stuff like that I just think it's really cool how these people are given it once and they have l lasting effects compared to some of the medicines that people are given and they're, they're taking them every day and it's, it's just not working. Um, there's more suicide uh, deaths in the U.S. than car accidents and breast cancer each year at about 40, 43,000 people. Um, and... I'm not saying it's fully ignored, but it's clearly not being treated the way that it should be treated. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed the book review. Once again, here it is. How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. And this is a really good introduction book just for people um, looking for good information. Um, I guess that's all I have to say, but uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed.